Welcome back into the Red Zone Podcast. My name is Colton Bartholomew, your view football beat reporter here for the Wisconsin State Journal, joined by longtime basketball and football beat reporter Jim Paul Zien. A little late getting the podcast up today because we wanted to make sure we had this Maryland game to talk about Wednesday night. And then with a late tip off, Jim had to work all night and got up early for me this morning. So I appreciate that. So, uh, I mean, big win, or I, I, not big win, but a solid win for the Badgers last night, Jim. Kind of a bounce back after a disappointing game. We're going to get into it in a lot more depth, but just kind of what's your overall take from last night? I think it's an important win. Um, I think anytime you lose to a team at home, you need to get it back. I mean, being swept by Maryland, a team that only has three Big Ten wins, would have been would have been a bad look for the resume. It would have left this team with its first two-game losing streak of the season. So I think it was important to go and – play well, which they really played well in the first half. We can get into this, but um, a win is a win. I think you, I think you needed a win last night. Yeah, for sure. And we'll, we'll kind of intersperse some things about that Ohio State game from Saturday, just kind of a disappointing overall um, showing and then nice for them to get back. And then they've got a really important stretch. We talked about it last week that the stretch is big, and now you got two games coming up against Penn State back-to-back here. So we'll get into all that. A couple of uh, things that we're going to talk about rundown of the show. Uh, we're going to talk about this Maryland game, uh, look ahead to the back-to-back games against Penn State, one at Penn State, one at the Cole Center. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the football coaching, uh, co- quarterback's coach job that just opened up this week after uh, John Bud Meyer uh, is going to be leaving for Colorado State to be the offensive coordinator there. And then we got a listener question. I kind of threw up the, the call for those late, so next week we'll get it a little bit earlier so we can get some more in, but uh, uh, listener question there at the end. So... We will get into all of that right after this. All right, Jim, let's talk about this Maryland game. One of those games where it looked like for a lot of the, the first half and then out of the first few minutes of the second, it looked like the Badgers were going to be able to kind of blow them out and get comfortably ahead. But then Maryland makes a, a big run. So I guess let's start with the first half. What, what was your what was your kind of uh, take or takeaway from, from the first half where they got built up what was an 18 point lead? Yeah, 18 points at the half. I thought it was their yeah. best. I thought it was their most complete half of this Big Ten season. Um, you know, I think the Louisville game is kind of – it's probably the best they've played. But the caveat there is that Louisville didn't have its best player. So I kind of throw that one out. And just in Big Ten play, um, I would say the second half at Michigan State was pretty good, although I don't know that Wisconsin was great defensively in that half. So so that's why I think last night was that was their most complete. I thought they looked good on both ends of the court. Um, I thought offensively, and of course, if you make some shots, everything looks different, right? And Micah Potter got them going inside and out. Um, but I thought everybody kind of chipped in offensively. Defensively, I just thought it was a different team than we saw a month ago against Maryland. They they were shutting down driving lanes. Um, I think Maryland helped out a little bit by settling for some three-point shots. I, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why they weren't trying to take it to the rim more, maybe force the issue. But I thought Wisconsin's defense was really connected and, and sound and um, you know, it's 38, 20 at the half and you're thinking this game could be a blowout. And then, you know, the first eight minutes of the second half happens. Yeah. But just one little note on that first half. It seemed like whenever, I mean, they didn't have too many empty possessions. I mean, you always do a good job on Twitter of saying the points per possession and stuff, but anytime they had an empty possession, then they would get back into the post with Potter and he was abusing kids down there. And, I think that's something that we haven't seen enough of because Potter has shot so well from the three, or at least is such a threat out there that it, it changes the way defenses have to play, that he hasn't been as assertive as I think he can be down in the post. But then with that matchup against Maryland, just the the size advantage that he has, like that, that was going to be something that he was going to be able to win at all night, and he did. And I thought that was important to see that development. Like, yes, I can shoot the threes and affect the defense that way, but when we need a basket or – you know, to establish something inside, Potter gets down there and gets it done. Yeah, no, that's a good point because the trade-off is Maryland's so difficult to defend because they have, you know, Dante Scott, who's basically a three, but he's playing a five in that lineup and he's surrounded by four guards. Um, The flip side of that is you can attack them down low because you have Dante Scott guarding Micah Potter. Um, You know, Maryland would bring in Galen Smith, who's like a 6'10 reserve, um, but he got in foul trouble. He couldn't handle Potter either. So I, I think, you know, 
you're going to give a little bit of something on the defensive end with, with that lineup Wisconsin goes with against Maryland's small lineup. But the, the counter to that is you have to be able to attack. And I thought they did a really good job of that last night. I thought Potter played like a possessed um, guy. And he said after the game, you know, like he said, he was ticked off. He was ticked off from losing Ohio State, you know, his, the team he used to play for. Yeah. And I think, he, the... you know, I think he remembered the first game against Maryland and he just wasn't, you know, he was kind of quiet. So they, they need that from Micah Potter. I don't know if he can do that every night, but um, when he's playing well, this team is so much better offensively. And, and we saw that in the first half last night. Yeah. And that's something, I mean, Maryland's unique because there aren't a lot of other big 10 teams that are going to basically play three forwards and no, no real true big man. Like they basically play three, three wings. I mean, you mentioned they got a couple of guys, but they basically play three wings and two guards. And then, I, I think the, the first game between Wisconsin and Maryland, Wisconsin let that affect them and like got them out of their game. They tried to like match that for whatever reason. And I think the, the fact that they said, no, like this is what we're better at than you and we're going to attack it. That's good just to see, but you did mention, and, and the final score shows that they only ended up winning by five, but the first eight minutes of the second half, it was just a, two different teams came out of the locker room for the Badgers. Like, that first half team that, like you said, was playing so sound defensively and attacking the things they needed to offensively, first eight minutes of the second half, it was just a complete collapse almost. Yeah, they were settling for jump shots a lot. And some of those were late shot clock attempts, but I just thought they were shooting too many three-pointers and they do that every once in a while. And, you know, I wrote about earlier in the week that they need the three-point shot to fall. And this team is very much built around the three-point shot. Um, But, you know, they're better. And Greg Gard said this really week, they're better when they get the ball in the 10 foot zone, what they call the TFZ um, and work inside out. And we saw that a bunch last night in the first half. So I thought they got out of sorts offensively and then Maryland started hitting some shots. I mean, it, yeah. it, they were due to knock down some shots. They hit some tough ones. I thought too. And then all of a sudden you get some momentum and, and it spirals in a hurry and, and it's down to a three point game. I thought that three point shot from Brad Davison to kind of just um well, the momentum was huge. And then, yeah. I, you know, if I remember correctly, Maryland went down and missed some shots. So, you know, it's, you, I'm impressed that Wisconsin didn't collapse completely, but it, it, the first 10 minutes is worrisome. And the last seven minutes, I think we're going to get into that <laughs> too. You look at Wisconsin's offense in the second half yesterday, it's crazy. They scored 14 points over a span of seven possessions. That's the 14-2 run. And Potter was responsible for nine of those. He had two three-pointers and a three-point play. So that's 14 points over seven possessions. That, that's great basketball, right? It's not sustainable, but it's really great basketball. Yeah. And then you look at, they only scored like nine in the other 23, I think I have, <laughs> or 24, nine points in 24 possessions on the uh, sandwiched around that little run. That's, that's, you know, that's yuck. That's gross. It's, um, it's, you got to fix that stuff. I mean, you can survive it when it, when you've led by 18 points in a game. Um, but it's just, it was hard to watch for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned the late shot clock stuff, and I just felt like in that first half, Wisconsin was a lot more definitive about what they wanted to do and getting to it early in the shot clock to give them time to work off of it. Like, they got the the ball out of the post uh, to Potter within the first 10 seconds. So he's got 20 seconds, basically, to make a move, try to get to the basket, or find somebody open and, you know, continue running the offense. Felt like in the second half, they were doing something that – this has become, like, pervasive in basketball and it infuriates me – but they wait until like the 10 second mark to, to start an action. And I, I don't get it. Like why make it harder on yourself? And I get it at points like you're, you have a big lead. You're trying to milk some clock while running your offense, which I, I get that part of it, but it's like trying to run two minute offense when there's 10 minutes on the clock. Like that's not in football. Like that, that's just not good. And it gets you out of rhythm. And I think that that was pretty evident last night that when Wisconsin was trying to do that, milk the clock while also playing offense, it wasn't working. And then it led to, some contested shots, some rush three pointers, like just stuff that they nobody's good at. You know, if you, if you're good at that, you're going to be the best team in basketball. But uh, things that they they have proven that that's not their game. Yeah, it's a tough one for me because I, I understand to some degree the the logic there is the only reason the only way you lose that game is if you um, if you don't run the clock there, right? I mean, as long as you run the clock, as long as you run. 25 to 30 seconds off the shot clock every time down the floor, you make it almost impossible for a team to come back from a 15 point deficit in the final seven minutes. 
So I get that, but I, I agree with you that it'd be nice to see some offense run earlier in the shot clock. I think one thing too, and a lot of people have done my timeline about this. I've gotten a couple emails already this morning is Potter wasn't in the game for a big chunk of that final seven minutes. Um, I think that was because defensively, again, it's a nightmare matchup. He's if he's chasing Dante Scott around the court, um, it, it's just not ideal. He also had a turnover at the 530 mark. Um, he threw a ball out of bounds on a on a backdoor. He thought was what was he what he thought was going to be a backdoor cut from Johnny Davis. Um, so it's hard to be good offensively when he's not in the game, right? And yet it's hard to be as sound as you want to be defensively against that lineup when he is in the game. So it's 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 a trade off, and I kind of see what Greg Gard was doing there. Um, again, the only way you lose that game is if you. Uh, you let the pace get up. You let it. Yeah. Right. And you give up three pointers on the other end. Right. And so I think Greg Gard was going with a defensive mindset down the stretch. Um, and, you know, it, it looks a lot better if you, like you said, if you make some of those shots late in the shot clock, um, it looks a lot better. Trice really struggled and he struggled the, the game before too late in the game. Um, I, I'm starting to wonder a little bit how much gas he's got left in the tank. You know, he's played a lot of minutes and I wonder if he's just going through a thing right now where he's, a little bit tired. Um, that's pure speculation, but, yeah. but again, the, it looks different if he's making shots at the end of the shot clock, which he's been known to do this season. Yeah. And to your trice point, um, not only playing a lot of minutes, but carrying the team, like those are hard minutes, you know, it's not like he's, you know, be able to take a break on either end because he's their best guard defender that they have. And then at the other end is, is leading the offense, uh, both in facilitating and scoring. I mean, he, he's got quite the load on him this year. And they were, I mean, and Maryland clearly wanted to pressure him a little bit. They wanted, yeah. you know, they put more sell a big defender on him. Um, so I think it just wears you out. And, and you know, Trevor Anderson's given them a lift off the bench. Um, and, and maybe he will continue to get more minutes. Because um, I, I do think they were, I don't know what his plus minus was last night, but he was in the game for a couple stretches where they really looked good offensively. And that's what he gives you. The flip side again there too is um, just not as good defensively as Trice is. Sure. And I really liked your story heading into this game. And if you guys didn't missed it before Wednesday's game, go on Madison.com and check it out. But I was talking about the three point shooting, because as we've seen, like when this team's hot from three, they're, they're really, really tough to beat, but it hasn't been that way really outside of Trice and Potter, the, the collective three point shooting really hasn't been there. Um, and you, you can describe a little bit better than I can, Jim, but when you look at how this team shot in that, that last season stretch, that eight, no run that helped them uh, win the big 10 championship or share it. Um, and then now with the six and three start in the big 10, I mean, just what is the, what, what are some of the differences that you're seeing outside of just the ball not going in? Yeah. I mean, like I really did a deep dive statistically to compare those things. And it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison because you're not playing the same opponents. Right. And COVID makes everything a little bit, challenging this year to compare. Um, but I, my initial impressions were that they were giving up a lot of, a lot more points in the paint. Um, and it's not true. They're actually giving up fewer points in the paint during, during the first nine games this year than they did during the final eight last year. Um, the big difference was three point shooting. They shot 41% last year down the stretch from three point range. And I think they were at 33% in big 10 play going into last night. Um, and I don't, you know, I didn't go back and watch every single game. But my impressions from watching games over this year has been that the shots are there. And that's, that's how I judge an offense, right? Um, are, the, are the open shots there? It, it, the, an offense works if open shots are there. Now, an offense is measured statistically by if the shots go in, right? There's two different yeah. things. Um, I'd be more concerned if the shots weren't there, if they're not getting open looks. And, and they are. Ohio State game, I, I, you know, I think Greg Gard counted about 11 or 12, 13. And that's when I went through the game and kind of subjectively said, is this a good shot? Is it an open shot? That's about the number I got too, is that a lot of those shots you take and, and you want guys like Davison, um, Trice, Potter shooting them. And Potter was 0 for 4 against Ohio State. He's 4 for 6 last night. That's that's a huge difference. I mean, that's yeah, 12 right. point production. That, that, that adds up in a hurry. So I don't know that anything needs to change. I know a lot of people are calling, oh, they need to they need to change this offense. They need to revamp this offense. And I just think this is the offense that fits these players. They just need shots to go in. Now, that said, would I like to see some different things? Like, I'd like to see them get to the free throw line more. Um, you'd love to see them finish a little bit better around the rim. I think they did last night. Potter finished better around the rim. I think that was a, a big key. 
So if they can pull all that together, I have, I think it has the makings to be, um, you know, an above average offense, a pretty good offense. And then they're going to have to rely on the defensive end to kind of take them to this elite level that they think they can get to. But I don't see any problems with, with the offense in general. Yeah. And I think there's just frustration with how the Badgers play offense when you look at how other teams do. But like you said, this fits the team and this is what the guys that they're, that they have on the roster. And we, we've said it multiple times on this podcast, really besides Trice and Johnny Davis, like who do you think is going to put the ball on the, on the ground and get to the rim? Like they don't have guys that do that. So if you're thinking that they're going to somehow morph into that team mid season, it's, that's just not going to be it. And I think one of the things that happened last night that, They've got to get, they've got to do more consistently. And this is probably more because of the matchup, the size advantage they had, but they were crashing the offensive boards really well. And they got a lot of easy baskets off of that, off possessions that uh, in other games when they weren't crashing the boards that hard became empty possessions. Like I think Johnny Davis had a couple, one in each half. I know Potter did really well down there too. So, I mean, like I said, Maryland playing the smaller lineup definitely influences that and changes what they did, um, what they can do rebounding wise. But I think that's something that if Wisconsin's going to get to that level offensively, like they've got to focus a little bit more on, because like I said, like they know that overall they're going to be a jump shooting team and it, maybe they get to the free throw line more going forward. That would help too. But if they're going to be a jump shooting team, you've got to collect some of those rebounds and do give your offense extra chances like that. Oh, that's a really good point. I didn't really think of that either. I mean, they, I looked at the numbers just now, they had seven offensive rebounds, which isn't a massive amount, but it's enough and it's what you do with it. They had 11 second chance points. So they're turning those opportunities. I mean, they're averaging more than a point possession on, on those opportunities that they get. So, yeah, I think that's key. I think, you know, you don't have to send everybody to the rip to the offensive glass, but a guy like Davis can just keep the ball alive and, and maybe, you know, maybe present a second chance. Um, I think that's huge. I think you're right. Especially for an offense that's struggling. Yeah, and it's weird because we watched Johnny Davis crash the – or Jonathan, excuse me. Jonathan Davis yeah. crash the boards. Um, he has a, a weird knack for rebounding, and you wrote about it not too long ago. Um, but he just finds the ball, and that, that sounds so simple, and it's like, oh, everybody can do that. It's like there's just something different about reading where the ball's going off the rim and putting yourself in that position that not everybody's as good at. You, and you see him beating big men to spots and some of that speed and, and uh, athleticism, but – a lot of it is just there's a natural kind of feel that he has about where the ball is going to go and is able to get it. And it's funny when you watch him make a play on or make a play on the game and then look at Twitter, you know, within the next minute or so, he's becoming a fan favorite and people, people want to see him a lot more. And I think he's starting to get closer and closer to starter minutes in the rotation. Even if he's not on the starting lineup. Yeah, I know. One quick thing with his rebound, he just seems to hang in the air longer than other people can, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I think that's just a gift. And as you said, I think he's got – his instincts are really good. I think that's one thing about his game that's probably a little bit underrated is he just – he seems to know the game. I think part of that is from growing up in a family where his dad was a, you know, college and NBA player. You know, they he's been taught the game ever since he could, you know, listen and talk, and I think that's huge. Um, I can't remember where I was going to go next. Uh the one thing is shooting, you know, that Stephen Bardo said last night, um, which I thought was really interesting that he thinks at some point, Johnny Davis is going to be the best player in the big 10. Now he's not saying it's going to happen this year, but at some point in his career, which I thought was, you know, interesting for an outside guy to say that I think we've all right. seen the potential he has, but um, I think the one thing, and we've said this before, the one thing that kind of completes his game is shooting. You know, he needs to become a better sh- shooter from the outside from the free throw line um mid-range I think that that makes him that makes him go from good to great and, and I think yeah. it'll happen I have no doubt that he's going to work on his game and and improve in those areas because he's just he just does so many things and um you can have him on the floor because he can guard you know basically one to four um without a drop off so it's it's you know he's clearly becoming an asset for this team yeah, if he could learn that uh, Demetric Trice kind of free throw line range ish pull up jumper off the dribble, whew, that would be that would be the move for if I was you know video game adding it to to the arsenal there. But uh, uh, one last thing on this Maryland game, and you wrote it in your gamer, um, Wisconsin is incredible when after in the second game in the conference, 
um, after they've lost to a team. And I'll let you dive in a little bit more, but that, that's something to me that shows not only the, the coaches do a good job adjusting and kind of correcting mistakes, but the players take those on the floor. And that that's a sign of not only the experience they have, but just a team that gets it, you know, like they're not going to make the same mistake twice against the same opponent. Yeah. And I'll start with the caveat that sometimes, sometimes when you play a team, you play them on the road the first time and then you play them at home the second time. And that certainly helps these stats, but I went back another deep dive this week. Um, I went back to the start of the Bo Ryan era. Seven teams swept Bo Ryan and the Badgers over 14 seasons out of a possible 96. They they had 96 (laughs) double plays in those 14 seasons. They got swept seven times. They were 23 and seven um, after losing to a team the first time around, which is a pretty incredible stat. And it's really carried over under Greg Gard. Um, So far, 30 double play opportunities, only three sweeps. Um, last night was the 11th win. So 11 and three in those second chance situations, seven and zero over the last two and a half seasons. Um, it's, it's really pretty incredible. I mean, two of those losses came in 17, 18, which, you know, not to revisit that season, but <laughs> obviously UW was injury riddled and it just was kind of a, you know, a tough season in general. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I tried to, I tried to ask Greg Gard about it. And he, I think he thought it was comical that I was throwing a stat at him that he had never heard. Um, <laughs> But he gave me a great answer. I thought it was a really good answer. And, and the guys too, I, I think they do take it personal when they lose to a team, especially at home. Like th- this has happened a couple of times too. Like I said, most, a lot, a large majority of this stat is based on you lose to a team at, um, on the road, on, on the road the first time, beat them at home the second time. But um, this is the second time I think that they've gotten Maryland on the road after losing them the first time at home. They did it to Minnesota a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty impressive stat to, to bounce back. And, and I think one of the signs of this program's, you know, stability over the years is just that it's, it, it learns, it, it, it mm-hmm. grows from its, it grows and it gets better as the season goes on. Yeah. And it's funny when you just think like, I mean, but Bo Ryan was hired in not 2000. No. A one. A one. Oh, one. Yeah. So 20 years in the, the quality of big 10 teams that have been here, like to only have, 10 in that 20 years uh, of sweeps. I mean, that's crazy, man. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And do you, do you have the list next to you? Like, who are some of the, the double loss teams? Um, Was that like the, yeah. the Greg Oden, Ohio State team or? No, there's a couple of Illinois. Oh, okay. Uh, Illinois, like 2008, 2009, Purdue got them twice. They, 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 Purdue ended up being a bad matchup at some point. Minnesota got them twice. Um. Purdue got him twice in seven, eight. So Purdue swept him back to back years. Uh, the Robbie Hummel years? <laughs> uh, I think so. I think that was that yeah. team, um, Johnson and Hummel, and uh, they're just really good. Um, 2011, 2012 was my first year on the beat. Iowa got him twice. Michigan State got him twice. Um, the next year, Michigan State got him twice again. So, you know, it's, there's not many, there's only 10, right? Yeah. <laughs> And it's a good team, like we mentioned. Yeah, they're not losing a bad team. Like I said, Illinois got them in 2004, 2005. Um, I think that's it. I think that might be the 10. And like 17, 18 was a weird season, like I said, where, where, you know, Wisconsin was down on bodies and um, got swept a couple times. So still a pretty incredible stat, I think. And, you know, the other caveat here too is they're not always playing every team twice, right? But, but I think the larger point is, 126 double plays over 20 seasons. They've only been swept in 10 of them is, is pretty incredible. I, yeah, I'd love to compare that to other teams in the conference. I'm guessing maybe Michigan state. Yeah. Maybe right. It's got to be somebody that that year in year out successful. All right. So Jim, let's jump into this, this Penn state matchup because this is a weird situation that happened with the rescheduling with COVID and all that, but they're going to play, the Nittany Lions twice in four days, right? So it starts on uh, Friday, Saturday? Saturday? Friday, yeah, okay. So Saturday, um, Saturday. Saturday excuse me, Saturday. Yeah. Um, so that's at Penn State, and then they come back um, Tuesday uh, against Penn State um, at the Cole Center. So first off, I mean, just when you – I mean, this is – if you guys remember from a couple of podcasts ago, this was Jim's harrowing adventure to College State – or College Park and – College Park, Happy Valley, um, and didn't get to 
uh, go to a game or anything, but uh, this is just a weird season for Penn State, not just because of COVID, but there's so much going on for them uh, off the floor right now that it's it doesn't make or it doesn't surprise anybody that they're not having too much success on the floor. Yeah, it was going to be a rebuilding year anyways because they they lost Lamar Stevens um, and from a team that probably would have made the NCAA tournament had it not been for COVID last year, um, and then you know so so you're thinking it was going to be a rebuilding year in general. And then in October, Patrick Chambers, um, I guess, resigns. Uh, as it turned out, uh, it was pretty much forced out. Um, so, you know, that's happening in the middle of a pandemic uh, when the team is just starting to kind of get ready for the season. And, you know, it's so it's been kind of a, a stop and start thing. And then they get to late December and they go on pause for COVID for almost three weeks. They didn't, they didn't play for almost three weeks. The Badgers we're supposed to play their January 3rd and that game got, got postponed. Um, so here they are uh, back to playing and they've actually been playing pretty well. They had one, two straight and then looked like they were going to win at Ohio state last night and couldn't pull it out, but yeah. it's, it, it's an interesting team. It's a, it's, it's, they've got shooters. It's a dangerous team offensively. I think they can put some points on the board, um, but Wisconsin's owned this series. They really have. And, I, in my time on the beat, so this is my 10th season, I have not seen Wisconsin lose to Penn State, um, which is pretty incredible. I think, I believe 2011 was the last Penn State win in the series, and I, it was a 36-33. Um, 36-33, that's not, you're not hearing Yeah, that was the right. rock fight game. Was that the Big Ten tournament? Big, Big Ten tournament, yeah. Yeah, yeah good so, Lord. <laughs> yeah. So it's the, been the, 10 years. I mean, it's been 10 years since Penn State's beat Wisconsin. And the, the funny thing is when you look at this Penn State team, like you mentioned, they were supposed to be a Big Ten or a NCAA tournament team last year. It's just the the parts don't seem to all come together like they like they should. Like th this team has talent beyond the wins they have right now. And we're seeing it right now in the NBA because that's how they kind of scheduled their, their season where you play a lot of back-to-backs or like two and three days, two and three days against the same team. I'm really interested to see what the adjustments are for both of these teams days in between those two matchups, because yeah, you have the travel component. So maybe you're not going to be like a full on practice, but you know, if you're both of these coaching staffs, you got to figure what works game one, they're going to adjust to and try to take away in game two. So you've got to kind of, I don't know if you hold anything back in game one to make sure that you have it for game two. It's just kind of a, a weird thing that you don't see in basketball a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're Wisconsin, you got to go in there and, since it's a road game on Saturday, you got to go in there and throw everything at them. I don't think you hold anything back. Um, I just think it's another game where it's important to win because you've lost twice at home already in big 10 right. play. Um, you got to go and win some of these road games, these 50, 50 road games. I don't know if this is classified as a 50, 50 road game. Cause I think Wisconsin will be favored by, I don't know, maybe six points. They were favored by three and a half last night, which I was, which surprised me. Um, so I think the number would be a little bit higher on Saturday. Um, but yeah, I think, I, you know, I think this is a game that Wisconsin's got to go in and play well. They're going to need to get off to a good start early in the game. You know, the good, a good first 10 minutes would be helpful and then just kind of grind it out. And Jim, as, as you kind of look at the, the matchups of these two lineups, like who is somebody that you think has got either a matchup advantage or something that, um, you know, that one of the other teams can't stop. Maybe a guy from each side that you think is going to be a problem for the other team. Yeah. You know, this lineup, this Penn state lineup is a little bit like Maryland in that they can go really small. I mean, they've got a guard oriented lineup um, guy like Myron Jones, who, who's shooting like 42% from three point range. Um, Isaiah Brockington is a guy that can get to the basket. He can also shoot from three point range. I think he's at like 39% or something. Um, so they've got some guys that can cause problems, athletic, you know, like we've said all along, Wisconsin has run into problems against athletic teams. And I, I do think that this Penn State team qualifies as an athletic type team. Um, on the flip side, I think it's almost a carbon copy of, of the Thursday, of the Wednesday night game at Maryland, Micah Potter and or Nate Reavers need to establish themselves down low because Penn State's just not very big. Uh, John Harrar is their, you know, he's a, he's their, he's their post guy. He's six nine. And I think he's the tallest guy on their roster. I don't think they have anybody taller than six nine. Oh wow! Um, so I think the key there is, you know, you attack the paint early, um, maybe get him in foul trouble, and then you make it. Yeah. Then you make it really tough on Penn State defensively, because 
again, you know, as good as they are offensively and they, they have the potential to put points on the board, um, they've struggled defensively. They're giving up almost 77 points a game. So you can score against this team. And I would, I would hope Wisconsin would go into this game and try to work inside out and try to establish the post early and then, you know, kick out to open shooters and then, you know, cross your fingers that the shots go in. Right. And I think one of the things that we've seen as, I don't know if I would classify as a strength, but something that Wisconsin can lean on is they're not going to give up a ton of open threes. Like we, we've seen them get beat to the basket and that's been a, a consistent thing all year, but they do a good job closing out and sticking on some of the shooters. So when you come into a game and that's what you kind of rely on as a Penn State team, that, that's going to be tough to, to get open looks or get the looks that you're maybe accustomed to with the way that you run your offense. Yeah, it's a good point. And we can kind of go back to the Ohio State game on this, on this point. Um, Wisconsin didn't give up a ton of three-point looks in that game. In fact, they were probably a little too eager to, to contest the three-point line. They, they closed out um, sloppy on a couple times and allowed Ohio State to use pump fakes to kind of set themselves up with mid-range jumpers. And, and Ohio State, you know, Greg Gard said this a couple times this week, but you kind of give them that. You kind of – these days, analytics say you give them contested two-point shots, and if they make them, you tip your cap to them. And that's what happened in the Ohio State game. Um, Wisconsin did a pretty good job at the rim. They did a pretty good job on the three-point line, except for leaving Justin Arns open a couple times. Um, they really got beat in the mid-range, and, you know, that's not easy to – it's a tough pill to swallow um, because you're kind of willing to do that. And when another team shoots like that from mid-range, you know, what do you do? Um, yeah. So I, I think they'd be content, again, is defending the three-point line. I think Penn State shoots like, you know, 25 to 30 three-point attempts a game. You want to – limit those good looks, um, keep them off the free throw line and, and keep them away from the rim. And if they beat you in the mid range, you know, contest those jumpers and, and make them do that. Right. Right. All right. So make sure you guys are following Jim on Twitter, Jim Polzine, WSJ, and then on Madison.com as well uh, for all the pregame during game and post game stuff for those Penn state matchups. All right, Jim, let's quickly talk about a little bit of football since some news happened this week. Um, John Budmeyer, the, the quarterback coach for the last few years and, uh, six-year assistant here under the, the Paul Chris staff uh, announced that he was going to be, or he didn't announce it, it got leaked and uh, was confirmed that he's going to be the offensive coordinator uh, at Colorado State, leaving uh, the Badgers here. Um, as I kind of look at this and evaluate where this hurts the most for the Badgers, I think it's going to be bigger on the recruiting side because we've seen what John Budmeyer has done, not only recruiting quarterbacks, but you know, I, I don't know how accurate the, you know, recruited by parts are on the recruiting websites. Like I, I take them with a grain of salt. When you look at some of the big names like Graham Mertz and then Deacon Hill in this class as the quarterbacks and some of the other offensive skill players that have come in, Bud Meyer's name has been attached to a lot of those. So I think I would take it with some merit that the guy that's run the quarterback and kind of the passing game coordinator that he became essentially, um, was heavily involved in bringing in those skill guys and not only, I mean, quarterback and skill guys are two positions that historically have been of need. You know, you think you have your answer in Graham Mertz, but you've got to continue getting some, some getting him some weapons. And I, I think losing a guy like Bud Meyer um, at this point, especially is going to be tough to, to bounce back from quickly in the recruiting side. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of people grumble about how many UW guys Paul Chris has on his staff, but the advantage to that is that you're sending a guy out on the road for recruiting who knows how to sell the program. He knows the program inside and out. He speaks from the heart when he, when he talks about coming and playing for the Badgers. Um, so that's, I think that's part of what made John Budmeyer a successful recruiter is that, you know, he's genuine, he's a good guy and he could sell a program that he cared for. And, and knew and, and, and loved. So um, it is a loss. I mean, good for John though. I'm mean, like, I, I, I guess I, you know, I didn't really see this coming. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I understand that John, you know, is an up and comer. Um, you just never know how that stuff's going to work. You need connections. You need word of mouth. I'm sure Paul Chris gave him a glowing endorsement. Um, so good for him. It's just, but it's, it's at this point, late January, um, it'll be interesting to see where they where they go from here. Yeah, and just from a, a football kind of for for him standpoint, huge opportunity. I mean, Colorado State struggled really bad. I mean, they didn't they only played four games because of COVID uh, last year, but the offense was not good, and the cupboards are pretty bare there. I mean, 
I don't think he's going to get judged for how they do in this first year, but uh, there's, there's a disadvantage there where it's going to be a struggle, right. To start off. And then that kind of puts you behind it in some ways, but then the advantage there is he kind of gets to mold it. You know, he gets to do what he wants, call plays um, for the first time, at least publicly, you know, <laughs> that we know about. Um, and I think that that's a huge step up for him. And, you know, who knows what the future holds for him. Like, but that's, that's the step you got to take as a quarterback coach. Like, unless you plan on just being an assistant forever, you got to make that jump into coordinator eventually. So a um, younger guy. And I think that goes for what they're trying to do at Colorado state. Cause they've got a pretty young staff out there. So um, uh, yeah, big step for him. And it, it was just kind of cool. It's, it's always cool to see guys like that, that get opportunities because you, you've seen what they've done in, in the one role at Wisconsin, and then they go and do something else. You kind of just follow them as they go along and just see how they do. And, um, just the, the ideas that they can bring, because I think that's, and we're going to get into some possible replacements in a second here, but I think that's one of the things that's kind of become a talking point is maybe this is a chance for Wisconsin to bring in some, some different ideas or somebody in the room. That's not going to be as like, you know, step-by-step step in line with Chris, like you've got to be in line with your, your head coach, but just somebody that can maybe present some new ideas or present some different things that, that maybe push the offense a little bit into a different direction. Yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm interested to see who they're going to go. Um, one quick thing on Bud Meyer going to Colorado State. I do think it's uh, that level, going to that level um, is is a good level to be an offensive coordinator at. I mean, it's not that's not a power five program, but it's it's the next step down. Um, there's a connection there, UW connection. Brian White is the running backs coach, former UW offensive coordinator. Um, the head coach, Steve Adazio, is a guy that likes power football. So I can see why he'd want a guy like Bud Meyer that has that as his background. Um, they're going to run the ball. They're going to play action. I, I, I do think it's a good fit. And um, I think Adazio is a pretty smart head coach. So I, I think it's a good fit for him. Um, so turning back to the UW angle on this, what, who do you think, what, what, what are some names? What, who do you think, um, what, what type of guy do you think they'll look at? So that's a good question. So if they stick with the guy that has UW ties and, you know, has the experience there, Scott Tolzien's in coaching right now. He, he was an offensive analyst a couple, two seasons ago, went to the Mike McCarthy Cowboy staff. Um, I haven't seen anybody that's really reporting that he's, he's interested in the position, but I, I know that's been the, the Twitter banner of the last 24 hours is that Scott Tolzien would be somebody that they would want to see. Um, the advantage there, obviously, is that he's he played the position here at a, a high level and three and a half year starter, basically. I mean, uh, a long time starter, a guy that knows what they're trying to do. Um, the only drawback there to me, I guess, would be, like I said, just kind of more of the same. I, I don't think Tolzien's at a point in his either his coaching career or professional career that he's going to be trying to be super innovative offensively or trying to change what the Badgers are doing. I think you would try to elevate it, obviously, but uh, I think there's, you just look at what Ohio State and Penn State are doing offensively and the points that they can put up. And you, you've got to climb that level if you're, if you're the Badgers at a certain point. And if that's a schematic change or if it's just a talent change, we'll see. But that, that's your competition, right? So uh, to me, if I'm the coaching staff, I'm trying to, to push and elevate what we're doing or change what we're doing to a point that we can get to that level. And I'm not, I'm not sure if Tolzien is that guy just because it's a little bit more of the same and kind of has that same DNA. I don't know. I, I, I just think there's, there's goods and bads to, to Tolzien as, as an option, but I'm sure that he's going to be a call. How attractive is this job? And I asked that knowing that like, like what you're talking about is bringing in a guy that um, is a little bit more innovative. Um, the challenge there is that you're bringing in an outsider and he's going to want his voice to be heard, right? On an offense where there's a coordinator above him and a head coach who's very offensive minded. I mean, it's his, it's his baby. It's the offense is his baby. Um, so I, are there obstacles there in terms of finding someone who is willing to come in? I mean, do you see any way that they would hire a quarterback's coach slash co-offensive coordinator just to spice up the job role a little bit? Um, if, if there's someone out there an up and comer who they are trying to pursue. Yeah, it's certainly possible because I think you've got to look at what Paul Chris is wants to do. I mean, if Paul Chris wants to call plays again, 
I mean, I, I personally, I, I think at this juncture, that's probably the most likely thing is get somewhat of a normal off season and Paul Chris takes back play calling. Um, but to your point, let's say that that's not the case and they go with Joe Rudolph again as a play caller, or they change up a little bit on the offensive structure. I definitely think that'd be a possible thing because if you're going to bring in somebody from the outside, as we're talking about in this scenario, giving them a little bit more of say, and I don't know if control is the right word, but just a, a different level of input added to the fact that, you know, you've already got Graham Mertz. That, to me, that would make the job pretty attractive. You're coming in with a guy that's got a ton of talent. You're not walking into a position group that you're not sure who your starter is or you don't know <clears throat> what you've got. But at the same time, like, you you want the Illinois version of Graham Mertz where, yeah, it was 21 throws, but he completed 20 of them. Some of them were deep, making big plays. You don't want what we saw last, second half of the season after the COVID diagnosis and everything where there's hesitancy. It's only a few, you know, it's 15 to 20 throws and, he had multiple games of, you know, eight, nine, 10 completions. Like you want to, as a quarterback coach, your guy to be able to have a little bit more chances than that. And I, I would think if they brought in somebody from the outside, there would be just a different level of input that they would bring. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Like I, I, I wonder how outsiders view this job and this offense and the ability to kind of, um, will they be willing to, be part of an evolution of it? Um, or is Paul Chris even think there's an evolution that's required? I, I'm curious if you sat down with Paul Chris and asked to kind of, he'll, and he'd never do this, but yeah. but evaluate the offense this season and how much of it was um, just COVID interruptions and missing players and, and all that. Um, if he thinks there was, that was the biggest reason for the up and down nature of it. Um, or is there more of a schematic issue? Is it, was it more of a, was it play calls? Was it scheme? Was it, um, something else? And the other thing we didn't mention is this offensive line wasn't great this year, yes. right? Which is the lifeblood of this program. I mean, you, the best offenses here have been because they've had really, really good offensive lines. And I don't think this, this group this year, you know, classifies as that. And again, I think part of that goes back to COVID-19 interruptions and, practice and just the, the inability to um, have chemistry because of that. So I, I, you know, I don't want to say, say this was a throwaway season, but I do wonder how much they, when they sit back and evaluate what happened, how much blame is going to be directed at, at the pandemic and, and the disruptions caused by it. Yeah. I can tell you just from the, the interactions I have with fans and the, the feeling that I get talking to some people, like it is, it's being thought of as like, let's just pretend that didn't happen. Like, let's move on as quickly as we can. Sorry, looking forward here. Um, one other guy I want to mention as a candidate, um, Keenan Bailey is, he's got kind of a hybrid role on the Ohio State staff. He's listed as an offensive analyst, but he works pretty closely with the quarterbacks and the offensive coordinator uh, and Ryan Day. Um, he's a guy that's been reported on a few times about being ready for a jump and kind of that, that next wave. Because, I mean, Ohio State's been – kind of uh, a proving ground of sorts for those, so I guess, I, it's, I don't know if it's fair to say lower level coaches, but just not exactly position coach or, you know, uh, coordinator level, but guys that get their start there as a GA or as a quality control person, stuff like that, um, very quickly learn the, the standards that they got to hold themselves to, the things they can do offensively to kind of um, jumpstart an offense. And I think he'd be a guy that would be interesting if he's looking to make a move, just because I think, and Graham Mertz is not Justin Fields or that level of, you know, mobility and athlete and everything. But when you just look at the passing game, you know, skill wise, I think he's on the level of thrower that Justin Fields can be at his best. So I think that's something that could be interesting to a Wisconsin if he was ready to make a move. Interesting. And that's, that's, you know, that's why I'm, I'm curious which way Paul Chris goes. He's been around the business long enough that he has connections. Um, there could be a name out of left field. Like, you know, when Elvis Wooded was hired last year, that was a little bit, you know, that wasn't in the UW family by any means. Um, he had coached the Packers, so there was a state connection. But um, I think there's going to be a lot of applicants for this job, and um, it'll be interesting to see kind of where he where he goes to fill this spot. Yeah, and I'm, I think this is a really interesting 
position coach to fill because this is such a crucial time for the quarterback spot. You've got Mertz, so and you know the offseason development of him to me makes or breaks next season. If he if he's you know a significant step better than he was this year, you've got a chance to be a really good football team. If he stays what he was or you know even moves back, you're in trouble to me offensively. I mean, I just don't think you've got the the position or the people around him that they can elevate him. He, he's got to elevate what's around him uh, from the quarterback spot. And then you look at what else has happened this off season at the quarterback room, Jack Cohn transfers. You, you lose a, a veteran voice and a guy like if Mertz was really struggling next year, maybe Cohn would have been able to step in again, or, um, you know, just a lot of different things that he brings to a room and he's not going to be there anymore. Um, so you're going into a season with, Basically, Mertz, who's got seven games of up and down COVID experience. Wolf, you know, didn't show a ton as a thrower when he came in. I mean, he made some, some tough decisions. Um, and then you've got inexperienced guys like, I mean, older but inexperienced in Vandenboom. And then a freshman coming in at Hill and then a walk-on in Daniel Wright. So, I mean, th this is a really important offseason for this quarterback room to really grow, and especially for Mertz and that, that to me makes this quarterback position hire super important because this person probably more than anybody else is going to be responsible for getting Graham Mertz to that level, you know, matching his potential with his output next season. Oh, by the way, um, you're heading into another off season that's at least going to be partly affected by the pandemic again. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, like, like, that's the thing. It's when you're talking about bringing in a new coach and development and all that stuff, it's going to be a challenge again because, you know, we're not out of the woods yet with this by any means. And I don't know when, I mean, I don't know what spring football is going to look like. Um, you know, none of that. And off season, just, there's so much unknown. Like you hear that every week from every sport that there's that the unknown is kind of what's um, crazy about this. And I think it's the same thing with football. So it is, it's an interesting time to make a hire. Um, and, you know, like hiring Kalaji made a lot of sense to have stability, right? A guy that they knew, um, this one is not going to be necessarily a guy that they know unless you bring in Scott Tolzien, um, if he's willing to make that jump. I mean, like, I think if I, like you said before, I think they make that call to Tolzien. And I think if Tolzien is willing to come back, I think it's a probably a no brainer, easy hire in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the path of least resistance, I guess you would say. It's just a matter of whether Tolzien, is that something he wants to do or if he wants to kind of continue in the NFL in that role? I don't know. It'll be interesting. Yeah, for sure. All right. Wanted to get to a listener question. Like I said, I threw this out kind of late, so we only got a couple, but um, we already kind of answered one of them as we were talking. So um, the other one we have from Steve Baining, and this is more for you, Jim. You want to know about Ben Carlson. Is there any news on him? I know that there is a, the injury factor for him, and that's kind of been murky. He got minutes in the first few games uh, as they were figuring out the rotation, but now we haven't really seen him. So what, what's the update that you can give us? Yeah, the update is not that there's not much of an update. Um, it's status quo. He's out indefinitely with an upper body body injury. Um, I don't, I did not expect him to play again this season. And that's not any insider information. I just think at this point of the season, you're now in the second half of big 10 play. Um, it, it'd be hard for him to get in, a, get in the rotation and establish himself after he's not even practicing at this point. So I, I, I just think this is going to be, um, you know, kind of a lost season for him and you hope he bounces back from this ailment and, and can help you in the future, but not really any update. Um, he goes on trips, he travels with the team, he's there for home games. Um, so he's still around, but nowhere near playing. Yeah. And that's one of the worst parts about this COVID year of not being able to be there is that you don't get to go to practice. You don't get to see what he's doing at practice, if he's working out or if he's able to play five on five or whatever he's able to do. So this is, you know, inside baseball for reporters, but this is rougher than just, you know, the, the games being weird, no fans being in the stands. It's just a different year being able to figure out team things about these teams. Yeah. It's, it's, I just had this conversation with someone last week, um, a former guy who's out of the business now. It's just, you know, conversations you can have on the side with coaches just to, you know, not even on, on the record stuff, just to find out tidbits um, just don't happen anymore. And it's just, it's, it's really hard to know as a beat writer, you kind of hope, you know, um, 
everything or most everything about a team. And it's in this situation leaves you kind of feeling like there's so much you don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. So as we wrap up the show here, Jim, is there anything coming up in the next few days people should be looking out for on Madison.com? Uh, no, I mean, at some point I'm going to write about this unique Penn State matchup t- twice in four days. Um, I think I'm going to write about uh, just how much success Big Ten road teams are having. Um, Greg Gard mentioned last night uh, how eerie it was at Xfinity Center um, just with nobody around. That's usually a place that's buzzing. That's, that, that was typically one of my favorite uh, road trips because the energy in that building is always exciting and, and I wasn't there. I didn't travel this week, uh, but Greg Gard was saying that it was um, just, it was quiet and more quiet than I think even compared to other venues they've been to this year. Um, so he, he just thought it was bizarre. And, um, and that's, I think part of why big 10 teams on the road have been able to have some success. It's flipped around for Wisconsin. They've, you know, they're now, I think three and one on the road in big 10 play four and two at home. So um it's going to be interesting. They've got some tough road games coming up. Iowa, uh, Illinois, Purdue yet to go. Um, those places aren't quite as daunting as they, they were when the, when the place is packed. So um, maybe Wisconsin can do some damage on the road down the stretch. Yeah. And I think this year, and I guess you could say even uh, this summer and everything like that, I think people understand more and more like how much fans and atmosphere make sports you know it, it's you know you can still I mean I, I watch a lot of these basketball games uh on mute and as I'm doing other things but like the the atmosphere as a whole really changes these games and that's just a fact that it's, it's indisputable yeah it really is um, and then you know I kind of poo-pooed this early in the season when, when some Big Ten I don't know when I mean Big Ten team is just teams in general went on the road and they're like well there's no fans I'm like you know you're still the home team you're in a gym that you're used to and I thought that would rule out you know I, I just thought that would win out the um the fact that these are rims that you're used to there it's a setting that you're used to you're sleeping in your own bed um i thought that would still mean a lot um and lately it hasn't the big 10 road teams are have, have been you know playing at above 500 clip this month so it's uh it's kind of an interesting to see it all play out for sure for sure um for me i'm asking that comes coming up hopefully uh Hopefully early next week, we'll have something on um, some recruiting stuff going on here in 2021, as I mentioned, uh, or excuse me, for the 2022 class. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of podcasts ago, it's been a slow start and it stayed that way here for Wisconsin uh, the last few weeks. So hopefully we have something on that. And then, um, oh, I mean, National National Signing Day is next week also. Doesn't really matter for the Badgers, but we'll uh, we'll look into that, just kind of why that matter or why that is um, this this cycle for for the Badgers not having uh to really bring anybody in for the 2021 class um here in February so some stuff going on there and then we're gonna get into bracketology it's almost tournament time Jim yes we're we're uh well yeah you say that knowing that how hell could break loose in the next month um but we're about a month and a half away from the NCAA tournament scheduled start uh, we, the one thing we need to talk about on this maybe we can touch on this next week is the notion of the big 10 tournament and what it would look like. Um, it's, it's such a weird year because so many teams are going to have to make up games um, as this season carries on. And, you know, what will the big 10 tournament look like? Will all 14 teams go? I I'm starting to doubt whether that's the case. Yeah. Same. Um, I mean, like why would you bring a uh, Nebraska, which has had a lot of COVID issues. Why introduce more, people into the mix. Um, so I, I'm curious to see how, what the Big Ten decides. I know they've talked about it. Greg Gard said they've talked about it. We don't really know what was going on in those discussions. Um, but I'm wondering, I'm starting to wonder if there's going to be kind of a reduced field for that for that tournament. Um, I don't know what the number would be. But, um, you know, like a team like Wisconsin doesn't really need it. Um, and yet I think the Big Ten will definitely want a team like Wisconsin there, right? You're going to want your best teams for the TV purposes. So I think we'll find out more in the next month about what that's going to look like, but I'm starting to wonder um, just what they'll do. And, and, you know, frankly, I think it's scheduled for Chicago tentatively, but my guess is they're going to play in Indianapolis. Um, yeah. And then you had a really long stay in Indiana in March. Yeah. If you're, if you're a big Ten team. Yeah. Well, let, we're, we're going to table that one and definitely talk about it for next week. Cause I, I'm totally with you. 
there is no reason for, for it to be a full full field like usual and double buys and all that stuff. Like, yeah, I, I definitely think we'll, we're going to get some clarity relatively soon on what that's going to look like. But we will talk about that next week. But, Jim, thank you so much for jumping on here in the morning uh, after a long night working. And uh, make sure you're following him, Jim Paulzine, WSJ, on Twitter. You can follow me as well, Seabart WSJ on Twitter as well. Um, for Jim, I'm Colton. We will be back next week. Thank you guys very much for listening.